<laughs> what is the best way? Oh, I love this because this is a rant. I love a good juicy rant. But buried within this rant is a question. <laughs> what is the best way to combat gun violence in our city? We hear about these gun buybacks and laws like in New York City that heavily restrict firearms as well as local ordinances that would prohibit guns in parks and public places. However, we do not hear about how we can protect those who would choose to carry firearms if they were allowed and ultimately become victims of restrictive gun-free zones, especially when our local police force is severely understaffed. Where is the discussion about mental illness and the lack of care and resources to deal with those who become violent? And further, why is there no discussion at the state level to provide funding so that our schools can protect children with armed security and other resources they need to keep our children safe? How will you further these discussions? <laughs> Discuss. One minute. We are having a gun buyback tomorrow, and it has been absolutely It is not, and it never has been, uh, the intent to try and bring criminals in. Al Capone is not showing up and saying, I just robbed the Chase Bank and here's my firearm. This is for the widow whose husband died four years ago. She has had a firearm in her bedside stand and has never felt comfortable with it. This is for the single mom who's got a teenage kid who's acting out and she doesn't want the gun in her house anymore. We had an individual show up at our ward office last week whose uh, brother committed suicide six months ago. The, the gun is in impoundment. He wants to pull it out of impoundment, to have it destroyed, to bring closure to that story. There is story after story uh, that that is the intent of the buyback we're having tomorrow, to simply allow people who are uncomfortable with the firearm in their home a legitimate way to dispose of it. We have to talk about mental illness, and you'll hear about that probably from 1,300 people up here. We have to talk about uh, psychiatric evaluations. We have to talk about the pharmaceutical industry. We have to talk about the cultural issues with respect to, uh, to violent video games and all of that. I would like to see uh, us to stop permitting gun shows until we, uh, until we uh, get our arms around the first and first and first and first. tomorrow morning uh, without background checks. And so uh, I hope we can have a rational discussion and I hope tonight is the beginning of it. In the last week when uh, Councilmember Kazachik decided to do this gun buyback uh, um, idea and asked me to join with him and I read uh, what he wrote and thank goodness I didn't need to edit it. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is I've gotten some blowback from folks and I engage everyone and, and what I've learned is that those who don't want to have the discussion believe that the Second Amendment is an absolute right and there are no absolute rights and I'm very much a civil rights person but the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Eighth Amendment all have reasonable restrictions and regulations on them. So we need to have that discussion and we need to have it with courage and we need to have it discussing facts. And it's an emotional issue, it is a red meat issue, uh, but if we're going to have a safe country, we need to have that conversation. And that does not preclude and should not preclude funding of our mental health system, better funding of our schools, the conversation with regard to keeping an even temper and civility in our political language. And uh, we will continue to have that discussion. Thank you. I, I, I actually appreciate where that question, where that rant was coming from in that it isn't going to be an easy solution to be able to solve any of these problems. In part because it's been a long time in which we've seen, I think, our sense of community in this country unravel. And we've seen ourselves isolate each other from each other. It's particularly over the past like 50 to 70 years. And I think part of the solution to having a safer community is having a much stronger community in which we are bonded to one another once again in which we are able to actually be together in public spaces, celebrating public things, doing things like this, individually deciding that we're not going to isolate ourselves within our homes, within our garage door opener every time we come home at night, 
take public transit, not just drive alone, do a lot of things that don't isolate ourselves from one another. I'm concerned of what's happened, particularly to our adolescent boys, that we've, we don't really have a lot of rituals of passage from boyhood to manhood in this country. And I think there's a lot of boys who are becoming men without having a lot of parenting to show them in which way it's going. So I think we need to do a whole lot of things and it's going to take a long time and it's not going to be easily solved. But I, I hope that you're all going to be there for that conversation of how we rebuild community in this country. Yeah, it's tough in 60 seconds to, to kind of nail this, but you know, the profile, the profile of people to, uh, uh, you know, who commit many of the horrible things that we've heard about have, have four or uh, at least six of these things. Um, and uh, it's, de it's uh, depression, isolation, agitation, access to a weapon, substance abuse, and mental health uh, and treatment issues. And we have to approach these problems on all of these levels. And we have to discuss these things civilly. I think we, the issue of isolation that, that Steve referred to, our faith communities have to come up to bat here immediately, our behavioral health entities. We have to show people how to deal, how to identify folks who are getting isolated. It's that agitation, isolation, and depression that lead, lead you to serious, serious problems. And we, we know who these people are in our schools. Rather than seeing armed guards show up, I'd rather see a lot more counselors show up. Identify and, and deal with these children. All, all the, the kids that come through their school system, most teachers know who they are. They know these kids who are isolated. They oftentimes don't have the resources to deal with it or, or the knowledge base to deal with it. And that's uh, a story. I'm sticking to it. Representative Steele. Thank you. I have been working in the mental health field for many years now, and we now have three professional counselors in our state legislature, including um, Senator Bradley. Um, we're, we're very fortunate. Mental health is a really important part of the answer for public safety. We're going to have to fund it. We're going to have to fund it. This, this is not a partisan issue. This is a humane issue. And with that in mind, I, I am taking a, a lead, actually, from Congressman Barber, and we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet, but he, earlier this year, has um, submitted some legislation on, um, it's called Mental Health First Aid, in which you can better identify people who are having problems and intervene and help get them the help that they need. We need more people to be able to do that. With that in mind, I am doing a statewide version of that. And just tonight, I, with bipartisanship in mind, I talked to Ethan Orr, and Representative-elect Orr has agreed to work on this with me. So we have a I applaud Councilman Kazachik's effort and work on doing the buyback program. I really think that is wonderful. Under very stressful, very tough circumstances. If this is about protecting our children and our citizens, it's not about the Second Amendment, what he's doing. You know, a dangerous gun left unwanted, a child in the house, a weapon that a curious child might find. So it is more important, children are more important and members of the community are more important to me than the Second Amendment. This is an issue that has a very personal aspect for me and for my family, as you know. Uh, I survived a, a shooting, mass shooting, a, was two years ago tomorrow, and uh, as a survivor, um, I saw, because I remained conscious, I saw uh, the impact that a young man who was clearly disturbed, uh, undiagnosed and untreated, uh, with a, a gun that had a magazine with 30 bullets in it, I saw that in less than 45 seconds, he shot 19 people, six of whom died. And to me, 
that kind of firepower is a central issue that we have to address. You know, I spent the last two years focused on an area that I know the best in this regard, and that is mental health. And as uh, Victoria said, introduced a bill, a bipartisan bill, and I hope all of mine will be, uh, to deal with the, um, the to expand the, the mental health first aid program, which has been hugely successful here in our southern, southern part of our state, to get it across the country, and hopefully we will see legislators taking it up as well. Uh, that's just one. I'm going to continue, David, because I really want to examine this a little bit further, and if you'll indulge me. Um, the mental health issue is huge, but it's important for us all to know and to recognize that over 95% of people with a mental illness never commit any kind of violent act. In fact, they're more likely to be victims of violence themselves. But, a person, particularly in that transition age between, say, 17 and the early 20s, where we see a lot of these young perpetrators of these mass killings do their, their killings. Um, that's, a, that's a group that we need to focus on, as well as younger people as well, and to identify and help people understand what they are seeing when they see mental health symptoms, where they can get treatment, and how they can help someone. And I'm concerned about some of the national discussion that's going on to expand the commitment laws, to put more people in institutions to deal with the problem. That's not the answer. Treatment is the answer. And hopefully community-based treatment is the right answer for that. So I formed a task force which will be having its first meeting this Friday of local people from my district, mental health people and others, uh, to help craft uh, additional legislation in the area of mental health. Let me just say to you what has happened in my evolution over the last several weeks. When, when the children were killed in Connecticut, that, I believe, was a turning point for the country. It certainly was for me. Yep. When I saw on Sunday, the, the Sunday after that Friday massacre, a photograph of a child, the first photograph of a victim, um, who was uh, publicly released. This little girl, her name was Emily, the photograph of her looking out from the page, a little lock of uh, blonde hair across her face. When I saw that photograph, I saw my granddaughter Elsa, I saw my granddaughter Tilly, who were the same age as those children who were killed. One of them, the young boy that was killed and buried the first day after the shooting, had 11 bullets in him. That kind of firepower allowed a massacre to occur on the most innocent people in our society, and we have to do something about it. So, for me, as a Second Amendment supporter, I really believe the Second Amendment is an important amendment, which has been upheld not too long ago by the Supreme Court, is an amendment that allows Americans to bear arms, to have, uh, have weapons. But even within the law today, it's never been challenged constitutionally, there are restrictions on the types of weapons and, that are allowed in any of our homes. And so, well, you know, I think that's probably an inappropriate way to respond. I'll be happy to talk with you about it later because it is, in fact, the truth. Now, I think we came here for a civil discussion, not that kind of an exchange. I haven't called you in. And I will call you in the same because we will sit here and have a dialogue. And let's follow the rules, please. Now, let me just finish with saying this. We are going to have legislation, but the only way that the mental health portion of that and the gun issue uh, respect or aspect of that is going to be dealt with by this Congress, which is filled with gridlock, is if you as citizens stand up and let us know what you believe we should do, and I'll be listening very carefully for your response. Thank you so much for listening. And then we'll move on to another question. Well, I think any time a child is, is hurt or, or killed in any sort of tragedy, it does give you pause. And it makes you think about how you prevent that. We need to have conversations on how this never happens again. And I think some of my colleagues have correctly identified mental health is a very key part of this discussion, which is why I've been, a, I've been an agency director within the mental health field for nine years now. And it's very important to me that we have proper evaluation and proper treatment. And I'm going to work very closely with my my colleagues and people in this community to do it. The other thing that's very important is school safety. 
Uh, one of the things that I've been working with different jurisdictions, some of the school districts in this area, and some of the municipalities in this area, is to make sure that we have properly funded um, school resource officers. Um, I, I'm actually introducing legislation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm introducing legislation. I've talked to my party leadership and representative from the governor's office to create a grant program that would have put the state in for a portion, put the city in for a portion, and put the uh, the school district in for a portion to make sure that we have school resource officers at all of our schools. One reason that's, that's it's important to protect our students, it's important because we've actually seen a statistical change in the crime rates. I was talking to uh, Danny Sharp, the, the uh, police chief of Oro Valley, just this last week, and he said, it's a deployment decision for me. I put school resource officers in all of my schools, and he said, the crime rate in the neighborhoods, the half mile radius, those neighborhoods surrounding the area has actually gone down. It's not just necessary, it's good policing. We're gonna see the fruit in the students, we're gonna see the fruit in the neighborhoods, and I think it's an area that the state and the city and the school districts can work together on.